Okay, we're recording. Um, hi, everyone. Nice to see you. I am going to start um, sharing my screen to give a little bit of an intro um, to tonight's presentation. We're really excited to have Caitlin here with us. Um, and I wanted to start by saying a big thanks to our Southeast chapter based in Juneau. It's a volunteer board of people in Juneau who organize talks. Um, normally they're in person, uh, but as you all know, we're in a, a new world of, of virtual Wildlife Wednesday. So we're really appreciative of the Juno chapter for getting Caitlin on this program. Uh, just a couple quick guidelines as we watch the talk. Um, we would not like to be Zoom bombed. And so what we're doing is muting your microphones and then um, to conserve bandwidth, we're generally asking that people stop their videos. Alaska bandwidth is a little touch and go, um, but you uh, are encouraged to use the full screen mode. Um, Caitlin has a lot of really great pictures. So um, if you're viewing this on a laptop, you can um, click that little box in the corner and make sure you can see these full screen. And then uh, throughout the presentation, again, to conserve bandwidth and keep the, the talk rolling. If you have a question throughout the evening, please feel free to use the chat function at the bottom of your toolbar. You can ask a question and then at the end, when we have time, um, I'll moderate those questions to Caitlin. You can also say hi to anyone you recognize in the participants. Uh, but the most important thing, of course, is to enjoy this time together and learn something new. I'll give a brief introduction to Alaska Wildlife Alliance for those of you who might be new to our organization. We were founded by Alaskans in 1978. We're a grassroots organization um, focused on the scientific management of Alaska's wildlife for present and future generations. Um, we have a number of programs, but the one that you're participating in tonight are our Wildlife Wednesday programs. These have been going on for um, years in the Juneau area and other places across the state. Um, as I said, we've moved everything online. So we do have a couple of upcoming Wildlife Wednesdays. These are all pulled from our website. So if any of these look interesting to you, um, please visit our website at akwildlife.org to learn more. And then uh, we record all of our presentations. This presentation is being recorded. So you can catch them later if you missed it. Uh, we have all of our previous Wildlife Wednesdays online. And in addition to educational programs, we do a lot of um, advocacy work for a, a broad spectrum of Alaska's wildlife. So um, also on our website, you can check out our latest news. We have um, different blog posts, for example, about the areas in Alaska that are named after wildlife and how wildlife has touched the culture of Alaskans. Um, uh, we also have opportunities for public comments or petitions, ways to get involved with Board of Game and other management meetings. So there's a lot of information if you're interested in learning more about our work and our issues. And finally, I wanted to give a pitch. Um, the Wildlife Wednesday programs are made possible by memberships. Um, and so much like we work to keep Alaska's endangered species from going extinct, uh, we depend on people like you to keep this program alive. So if you're interested in becoming a member, I'll drop the link in the chat. Um, and for Alaskans, it's pick, click, give season. We're an organization under pick, click, give, and we would really appreciate your support to keep programs like this going. And so with that, I'm going to hand the talk over to Caitlin, who we really wanna hear from. Um, she's gonna introduce herself and we are going to go through a screen share transition. Great, so thanks, Nicole, and thanks for inviting me this evening. Let's see if this screen share will work. Let's see. All right, what is everybody viewing right now? <laughs> we have it full screen, it's perfect. All right, let's see if the slide will transition though. I want to make sure I have it set on the right slide before we get going. The joys of Zoom here. <laughs> We're still on the title page. Okay. Hmm. There might just be a oh. little. Oh, there we go. I think there was just a little bit of a lag time. Yeah, we're, we're there. We saw the transition. 
All right, great. Um, so, like I said, yeah, thanks for inviting me this evening. Um, my name is Caitlin Kupferman. I'm currently a research coordinator in Dr. Jim Beasley's lab at the University of, of Georgia's Savannah River Ecology Lab. Um, but I'm actually here tonight to talk about my master's research that I conducted um, under the advisement of Dr. Sophie Gilbert at the University of Idaho and in conjunction with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Um, and so for that research, I focused on Fisher colonization and we also looked at their coexistence and possible competition with native species in Southeast Alaska. Um, and so for this presentation tonight, I'm gonna to go into a little bit of fishery ecology and the background um, for people who may not be aware, with that, uh, aware of that. Um, and then go into some of the habitat associations and research that we did surrounding that. And then also looking at possible species interactions and um, what we found with that research. So jumping right in, um, the fisher is a mid-sized mammalian carnivore. They occupy forest habitats across northern North America. They are what's considered a habitat specialist, where they favor mature forests with dense canopy cover and a lot of structural diversity within that forest. So prior to European settlement, the Fisher's Northwest Range extended from the Sierra Nevada mountains of Southern California to Northern British Columbia, but human activities like overtrapping and logging led to some significant range reductions over the last century. Um, but reintroduction efforts actually began in Nova Scotia in the 1940s as managers aimed to reestablish these populations of fisher as an important regional fur bearer and native carnivore. And since that time, over 21 successful reintroductions of fisher have actually occurred across their native range, which has led to some regional increases in abundance. And so you can just see this figure illustrates the fisher distribution as well as the reintroduction efforts that you can see by the red triangles. And you can see the differences in the historic contracted and their current range as well. So fishers have actually been documented in the Yukon region of Canada for decades, but recent accounts actually show that they have further expanded their range into the southern um, the coastal temperate rainforest of Southeast Alaska. And so the star on the map just shows where the fishers have been recently documented, which is right over the Juneau area. So beginning in the 1990s, there were a few reports here and there of fisher, um, mainly around the Taku River region. Um, but those reports have gradually spread throughout the region and become more numerous, particularly in recent years and over the last decade. Um, and so you can see just these different colors on the map uh, represent the current fisher harvest in these general broad areas. So you can see a lot throughout the Taku River region, but in recent years, as I mentioned, they've been documented the farthest north yet, um, and they also seem to be showing up farther south. Um, and so a lot of people have been wondering what might be bringing the fisher to the area or what might be allowing them to expand their range here. Um, and fisher range and winter movement is actually limited by the presence of deep, soft snow. They have what's called a high foot load, where their large body size makes them more likely to sink in areas of soft snow. And it also increases their energetic costs associated with travel. Um, and so decreased snow accumulation in Southeast Alaska actually might be contributing to their colonization of the area. And annual temperatures and regional snowfall are actually projected to further decline in the future, which will likely aid in fisher movement and their potential for expansion. And so just expanding on that just a little bit, um, this series of figures shows Southeast Alaska mean annual temperature with the past temperature range, uh, then the future projected temperatures under two different climate scenarios. Uh, and so you can see in both scenarios that the high temperatures, which are indicated by the darker orange areas, are projected to increase in the coming years. And then similarly, these show the past normal range of precipitation as snow versus, versus the future projected snow um, with once again increases, this time in the light tan color, um, showing a decrease in snow in the coming years. 
Um, and so, as I mentioned, these changing conditions will likely aid in Fisher potential for expansion. And so our research kind of came in uh, because Fisher are new to the area of Southeast Alaska. Not much is known about their abundance, their habitat requirements, or the effects on the ecological community structure that this new carnivore might be posing to the, re to the region. And so when we started our research, we went in with a couple of different goals. Um, we wanted to look at the different habitat factor or habitat factors and environmental kind of covariates that might be contributing to fisher presence in the area. So different habitat associations. And we also wanted to look at how fisher presence might be affecting the native mustelids in Southeast Alaska. So I'm first gonna focus on these different uh, environmental factors or the different habitat associations. Um, and I'm also gonna talk a little bit about our, the on the ground methods that we use to determine these. So we conducted our research in the forested coastal area just north of Juneau. Uh, the study area was about 200 kilometers, uh, square kilometers and 32 kilometers long. Uh, as many of you probably know, it's comprised mainly of Western hemlock and Sitka spruce. It does have some deciduous trees in there. Um, and you can also see that on the three sides, the study area was delineated by water. Um, and then to the east, those conifer forests very quickly become steep mountainous areas that consist mainly of glaciers, snow, and ice. So we were kind of restricted to the lower elevations between those two areas for our study. We deployed 50 stations on that landscape, and you can see here, we set them up in kind of clusters, equally evenly spaced throughout the landscape. And this was in January through April back in 2018. And so actually on the ground, our, we had baited hair snags and remote camera stations. Um, and so you can see here, hopefully you can see my cursor when I'm pointing these things out. Uh, you can see here, this is one of our hair snag contraptions here. It's a little cubby uh, with gun brushes inside and bait suspended in back. Um, so ideally when a fisher enters one of these, they'll go in and uh, eat the bait in the back. And then as they enter and exit, their body will brush up against the gun brushes and ideally we'll be able to get hair samples, which we can then conduct genetic analyses on to identify individuals. Um, and from that, you can do things like get abundance estimates. Um, and so that actually was one of our initial goals going into the uh, study, but unfortunately, we didn't end up having enough of a sample size to do that particular analysis. But when, I, when I'm showing you these on the ground photos, that's why you're seeing those cubbies. We were very hopeful going into it. Um, so you can see these cubbies and hair snags. And then we also had a remote camera set up facing these so we could see what visited and um, pick up detections. And we also had this PVC pipe that had, um, we had measured at specific intervals so that we could get a general idea of animal scale and also to measure snowfall over time. So this is just, uh, these are some more examples of what some of our stations looked like on the ground. Um, you can see that we set them in what we considered appropriate fisher microhabitat, like under logs and near the bases of trees. Um, and you can see we also, we had lured the stations, especially because fisher are considered a rare elusive carnivore. Um, so we did want to make sure that we were actually getting fisher detections at these stations. And so, as I mentioned, going into the study, we didn't know what fisher might actually be associated with in Southeast Alaska. Uh, so we went in and measured a lot of different, uh, a lot of different habitat, abiotic and biotic variables um, to see what fisher might be associated with in this particular region. Um, so I'm just gonna briefly go through these so you have a general idea of what we were looking at. Um, we measured snow depth and snow density. Um, and so when you see these arrows, this means that we thought snow depth would have a negative effect on fisher occupancy because as I mentioned, they have a high foot load, so it might limit their movement in deep snow, um, which might limit their occupancy. Um, but snow density might increase their occupancy because it would make it more easy for them to travel on top of the snow, so it would be less of a limiting factor. Uh, we thought temperature, elevation, distance to road, um, vegetation height might have an effect. 
because of their association with mature forests in other regions. Uh, canopy cover aspect, things like prey, we want to make sure they have prey resources. Um, and then we also measured what we called behavioral effects. Um, and this was just essentially measuring whether a fissure had, detection had occurred at the station before to see that to see whether or not if they found the station once, they would return back to the station. So kind of to see if our lure and bait were having an effect or not. And so what did we find? Um, we found we had 26 fissure detections. Uh, we actually detected 15 different species across the whole season, um, 84,000 photos. So a lot of photos to go through, um, but we luckily got quite a few uh, detections of a lot of different species. And as you can see, we also had a lot of detections of other muscular species like Martin and Ermine. Um, and I'll go into that a little bit later, um, but this is just to give you an idea of what we were seeing on the landscape. And so this is a, just an image of a fisher approaching one of our hair snags there, one of our stations. This is an image of a fisher actually going into one of our hair snags. So we were probably successful, able to successfully get um, hair from that particular sample. You can see he's going in and ideally eating the bait and then the gun brushes will grab just a little bit of tear on the way out. And here you have a fisher checking out one of our lure boxes there. And so as I mentioned, we had 26 fissure detections. This just goes into a little bit more specifically where we uh, were seeing them on the landscape. We had them at nine different cameras or seven of these different uh, clusters on the landscape. And so broadly in terms of fissure occupancy, um, we examined all of those different variables like snow depth and snow density that I mentioned, uh, but we found that the variable that really contributed to fissure occupancy the most or fissure presence in this area um, was vegetation height. So as vegetation height increased, the fissure were more likely to be present at an area. Um, and we found that both on a site scale, so on a kind of a more localized scale right around where our camera stations were, and also on a broader scale on the landscape. So the vegetation height seems to be important for fissure in this area. And that does track with what previous studies have found that they're associated with mature forests. Um, and so this part of our research kind of established what important factors were contributing to fissure presence in the area. But we also wanted to see now that fissures are present there, uh, what effects they might be having on other species. And so now I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and go into talking about our research looking at the coexistence with native mustelids in Southeast Alaska. Um, and so as many of you may know, uh, species introductions can reshape native established populations and competition through both direct and indirect means can often play a significant role in these changes. Um, and so very briefly, for those who may not be aware, I'll be using these terms a bit throughout the rest of the presentation. Um, competition occurs when organisms vie for a common limited resource, but the degree of competition between species can be dictated by a lot of different factors, including overlap in diet, space, time, predators, and other resources. Um, but many ecological studies support the concept of niche partitioning, in which species that occupy the same guild or essentially have the same uh, resource requirements will adjust their use of those resources to allow for coexistence. So competition among mustelids has been documented as many are considered um, sympatric species. So when I say sympatric, I just mean that they're related species that are existing in the same geographic area and they may share similar resource requirements. So as I mentioned, Fisher and Martin in particular are sympatric carnivores and they share a similar diet, morphology and spatial distribution. Um, but the Fisher is actually significantly larger than the Martin and so it can compete with the Martin for research, resources like food and space. And often in competitive interactions like this, the weaker competitor, which is often the smaller competitor can be excluded. Um, and it's also been documented that Fisher um, can be a predator of Martin and Ermine. So that's another factor to take into account of competition between these species. 
So little is known really about the ecological impacts uh, that the new fisher population could pose to the native Southeast Alaskan muscalids. And so as I've touched on, there are already several species of muscalids in Southeast Alaska. You have the marten, ermine, have wolverine, you also have mink, river otter, um, and now the fisher. And so how does the fisher fit into the existing community dynamics in Southeast Alaska? Um, and so for the sake of my master's research, at least, uh, we focus just on the effects of that fisher may have on marten and ermine, um, especially because they generally have the most similar life histories and they're most likely to be affected by fisher. Um, and then going back to our detections, you can see we also had a quite a large sample size of both of those species. So 204 marten and 500, excuse me, 507 ermine detections. So going a little bit more into um, comparing these species, you have the ermine, which is about half a pound, give or take. The marten can be about one to three pounds. Um, but then you have the fisher, which, like I've said, is significantly larger, which can be about anywhere from four to upwards of 13 pounds. Um, but that being said, they all eat small mammals. They have similar dietary requirements. Um, the fisher's larger body size does enable it to eat things like snowshoe hare and actually specializes on porcupine, which is pretty fascinating that they're able to do that. Um, so they are able to um, eat slightly larger animals than the marten and ermine may be able to, but there is a lot of potential for dietary overlap. Um, and they also have relatively similar habitat requirements as well. So there's a lot of potential for competition among these species in the area. So when we were going in to research this, uh, we came at it from a couple different angles and we had three main objectives to try and tease out this issue of competition. We first wanted to look at whether Fisher, Martin, and Ehrman were actually occupying the same space on the landscape within our study area, or were Martin on one side and Ehrman on the other, is what we wanted to kind of examine. And then we also wanted to see if they were overlapping in time, so if their activity patterns throughout the day were the same or not. And that's going to be referred to as temporal partitioning for the rest of this, uh, rest of this talk. Um, and then building off of both of those, we also wanted to see if Fisher, Martin, and Ehrman activity patterns were actually shifting when in the presence of each other. So before we actually got into our study, we had a couple of general hypotheses on what we thought the effects of these species might be on each other. And so as I mentioned earlier, uh, competitors with larger body sizes are more likely to be dominant over smaller bodied competitors. And so based off of this, we hypothesize that there might be a dominant structure among the muscalids in Southeast Alaska, uh, particularly regarding spatial and temporal avoidance patterns. And so just looking at this graphic, we hypothesize that ermine occupancy and activity patterns would be affected by the presence of both Fisher and Martin, that Martin would be only affected by Fisher and have an effect on Ehrman, and that Fisher would be unaffected by either Martin or Ehrman, but like I mentioned, would have an effect on both of these um, hypothesized subordinate species. So going into the spatial component of this, um, I'm not going to get too much into the nitty gritty of the analyses, but if you're interested, I'm happy to talk about that at the end. Um, but briefly, for those interested, um, we went about this by conducting some two species occupancy modeling. Um, so just from this, you can, so from our camera data, you can use all of the different detections from species and their locations to identify co-occupancy patterns. Um, and from this, you get what's called a species interaction factor. Um, and so generally what you just need to take away from this is that a value that's greater than one generally indicates that species co-occur together more frequently than expected. A value less than one indicates that once one or both species might be avoiding each other. And then a value of one indicates that the species are kind of occurring independently in the area. Um, one may not be having an effect on the other. They're just kind of each going about their business. 
So in terms of spatial partitioning, um, we actually found that the species interaction factor was one. So it didn't appear that Fisher, Martin, and Ehrman uh, were really having an effect on each other, at least in space. And then moving on to temporal partitioning. So looking at the degree of activity pattern overlap. Um, once again, we had a coefficient that we measured. Um, and I'm mentioning this because some of the upcoming slides, you'll see this uh, triangle, this delta here, um, which is the coefficient of overlap. And so a value of zero indicates no overlap and a value of one indicates complete overlap. So it would indicate that the species share the exact same activity patterns. And in general, they can be categorized as high, moderate, or low based off of those different, uh, based off of the zero to one value. So looking at this, this was the activity patterns across all of the stations. So regardless of co-occurrence in space. And you can see that 54% of the Fisher activity actually occurred during the day. Um, where about only about 40% occurred at night, um, with much fewer occurring at dawn and dusk. Uh, and then in contrast, you can see that the majority of Martin detections, about 63%, occurred at night. Um, and similarly, Ehrman detections were also about 63% at night as well. So now this uh, plot is across all stations, regardless of co-occurrence. But if you break it down um, at just these stations where these species co-occurred, you can see that Fisher and Martin had a low overlap value. So the value, a coefficient of overlap is 0 0.44. Um, and you can also see that they kind of peaked at alternating times. And so you can also see this p-value here that indicates whether these activity patterns were considered statistically significantly different. Um, and so the value of less than 0.05 indicates that it was. So you can see that these Fisher and Martin activity patterns were considered to be significantly different. Looking at Fisher and Ehrman, you can also see that their activity patterns are significantly different um, and moderate overlap. And just looking at Martin and Ehrman, you can also see that they had similar times uh, that they were active, but that they were still considered to be significantly different uh, in overlap times. So at this point, we had established the degree of overlap between the species activity patterns, um, and that those activity patterns did seem to be significantly different. Um, so there's some evidence of temporal partitioning that in, in that they're using the same areas at different times. But then I wanted to see whether any of those species were potentially altering their activity patterns when they are co-occurring with the other species. Um, and so in order to do this, we looked at the activity patterns of each species at stations where they co-occurred with each other to stations where they did not. So first looking at just Fisher activity patterns. Um, if you look at plot A over here, the black line is Fisher activity at stations where no Martin occurred, whereas the dotted blue line is, <clears throat> excuse me, is stations where it did co-occur with Martin. And so you can see that Fisher activity does seem to be different, um, but you can see that the change was not considered to be significantly different. Um, so you can interpret that as Martin did not appear to be affecting Fisher activity patterns when they were present. Um, and then looking at plot B, in theory, you would see Fisher activity patterns in the presence of Ehrman versus not, um, but there were actually no stations with Fisher detections where we didn't also detect Ehrman. Ehrman were very prevalent throughout the whole um, study area. So we weren't able to see whether Fisher activity patterns differed um, in the presence of Ehrman versus not. Uh, moving on to Ehrman activity patterns, you can, looking at plot A, you can see that Martin activity did differ significantly at areas where it co-occurred with Fisher versus areas where it didn't. Um, and it appears to increase its activity actually during the day at stations of co-occurrence. Um, now, if you, you may be thinking, wait, the Fisher were detected most frequently in the morning. So Martin are actually shifting their activity to be more active when Fisher are. Um, but if you actually were to draw a line at 
fissure activity, um, it would actually occur right between these two peaks right in the morning, um, showing that Martin may be increasing their mid-morning activity at stations of co-occurrence. Um, perhaps and most likely as a result of the prey, um, we actually did map out the prey and the prey were most active during this um, mid-morning time. Um, but they're still adjusting it to occur on either side of the peak fissure activity. So that's a very, so that's an interesting finding. Um, and then moving on to plot B, you can see that Martin do not appear to be significantly altering their activity in the presence of ermine like they did for Fisher. Um, so this is consistent with the hypothesis we made that as the mid-sized muscolid, they would be affected by Fisher, um, but not necessarily affected by Martin, or I'm sorry, by ermine. And moving on to ermine, uh, the smallest muscolid in our research. Looking at these plots and the p-values for both Fisher and Martin, um, you can see that ermine did significantly alter their activity patterns in the presence of both Fisher um, and Martin, uh, seeming to increase activity around 3 a.m. and decrease it slightly during the early morning. Um, and so I know I just threw a lot of information at you. Um, so to briefly sum up, in terms of spatial partitioning, um, we didn't find any evidence to support uh, spatial partitioning among the three species that we looked at in Southeast Alaska. For temporal partitioning, we found that Martin had low overlap with Fisher, that they seemed to adjust their activity patterns in the presence of Fisher, that ermine seemed to adjust activity patterns in the presence of both Fisher and Martin. Um, but that Fisher did not adjust activity patterns in the presence of Martin. And like I said, we didn't have um, the data to be able to see whether they were moving their activity patterns in the presence of ermine or not. Um, but so far, these trends do show that the, um, it does lend um, validity to our hypothesis that there might be a dominant structure. And so looking back at this slide, um, we had predicted that there might be a hierarchical body size dictated dominant structure um, between these species in space and time. Uh, but we didn't find evidence uh, for spatial avoidance, but we did find that there might be some temporal avoidance um, occurring. So some avoidance within time. And so just uh, going back to a uh, brief summary of all of this research here. Um, in terms of the environmental factors we found that might be contributing to fissure occupancy, we found that vegetation height plays the largest role. Um, and then in terms of how fissure presence might be affecting native muscolids, there seems to be um, evidence of temporal partitioning in the area. Um, and so this was some important baseline data that we were collecting. Like I said, no one had really researched Fisher in the area before our study, um, which was really great to take part in. Um, but this does lend, there's a lot of potential for more research to occur um, throughout time, potentially to monitor trends throughout time. Um, particularly right now, there may not be evidence of spatial partition partitioning between the species. Um, but it would really be beneficial to monitor trends in fisher um, abundance and occupancy through time. Um, especially, it may, be, it may be that fisher currently aren't present in numbers large enough to have a visible notable effect. But if the population continues to expand, uh, these patterns could shift. And so it might potentially affect occupancy in the future or further affect those activity pattern differences that we're seeing. And some areas for additional future research, um, like I mentioned, people are wondering where Fisher might be, uh, may have come from. Um, it's often hypothesized they might be, have come through the river corridors from British Columbia. Um, so doing some genetic connectivity research might be really interesting to see the level of genetic relatedness between the fisher that are currently in the Juneau area and those that are in British Columbia and other areas to get a better idea of where they might be coming from. Um, and I mentioned it, but we did have a relatively small fisher sample size, unfortunately. And so that's why continuous, continued monitoring um, and an increase in sample size would be great. Um, so that we can really 
get more solid, um, make more solid inferences about what we're what we're seeing. Um, and another avenue that um, is actually recently um, being undertaken is to examine the diet of fishers. Uh, recently, uh, some biologists at Alaska Department of Fish and Game uh, examined the stomach contents of some fisher, and they might be using those to conduct some stable isotope analyses. And if that's the case, you can use the stable isotope analyses to determine fisher diet. And from that, you can see, of course, what they might be preying on in Southeast Alaska, but then you can also compare that to what the um, Ehrman and Martin diets are as well to see the potential for overlap and competition in that area. So that's another really interesting avenue that can be explored. And so some more broad research implications. Um, we now have a better idea of the habitat associations of Fisher in Southeast Alaska. Um, and so based off of this, we can really infer that there's a lot of suitable conditions in other areas in Southeast Alaska, um, particularly with the projected decrease uh, in snowfall, coupled with an increase in freeze thaw events that might lead to denser snow. It could really work to lift the movement limitations imposed on Fisher in the region and enable the Fisher population to continue to expand its population size and distribution. So I'm sure many of you know, um, but much of Southeast Alaska is comprised of a lot of tall conifer forests. And given Fisher's association with tall trees, you can see that there are a lot of other places in the region it could expand to. Um, and so this map was put together by the Nature Conservancy and Alaska Audubon. And it shows areas of Southeast Alaska with mid-sized to large trees, uh, which are indicated by the green and dark green. Um, and just for reference, the red rectangle is where we conducted our study. So you can see there's a lot of potential for fissure expansion, partic particularly along these uh, river corridors here or along the coastline. Um, and the Southeast Alaska also has a lot of islands as well with um, forested islands with potential habitat that are also already home to Martin and Ehrman. Um, so should Fisher find its way there, perhaps through frozen water channels, um, it could also colonize there um, and have um, different interactions with the Martin and Ehrman that are currently living there as well. And so as I mentioned, um, Fisher may have some increasingly pronounced effects on the native mustelids if they continue to expand their range. Um, and it's possible that with increasing abundance and distributions, we could start to see more of a spatial effect as well. Um, so I think it'll be really interesting to see in the coming years um, how the Fisher colonization continues um, and how it might impact uh, the region. And so overall, I think this research, I was. I was very fortunate to be a part of it, especially as a master's student. Um, it's not often you get a chance to research a species, a new species in an area. Um, and so I'm really grateful for that. Um, and it'll be really interesting to see uh, what uh, more research is done in the future and what more we can potentially find out. Um, and so I think I have a little bit of time. So I'd like to just uh, show you a few more images that we had on our uh, camera photos here. So here you can see uh, Fisher, very, very uh, beautiful in the sun there. And you can also see this was towards the end of our field season. So there wasn't any snow on the ground, which was not the case for quite a bit of the field season. And like, like you saw, we had a lot of Martin on camera, a lot of Martin detections. One checking out our hair snag there. And it's a little bit harder to see, but he's on his hind legs there. And so this guy is actually in front of a hair snag that was completely covered in snow after one of our big snowfalls there. And we got over 500 ermine detections. Um, and so they were everywhere. Um, and they often weren't afraid of us at all. We had one come right up to us while we were checking the trap one, uh, or the hair snag one time. Um, and they had a really bad habit of coming in and stealing our bait, particularly right after we'd set it. 
So that might have accounted for some of the reasons why we weren't getting fisher in our hair snags because, because there wasn't any bait left over. Um, and oftentimes the bait that they were stealing was just about as big as they were. So they're, they're pretty feisty little creatures. Um, and then, so this photo, there is an animal in this photo. I'm not sure if you've, if you've spotted it yet, um, but this is kind of just an illustration of when you're going through camera images, you wanna really make sure you're looking pretty closely because you can very easily miss species. Um, so if you haven't spotted it yet, there's a river otter right over here. Um, and this was on one of our stations that was a little bit closer to the coast. We also got a lot of wolverine on camera um, and they had a bad habit of messing with all of our hair snags and stations. So you can see here, he's just checking it out um, and he's a little bit too big, can't quite get to the bait and back. So he decided to just kind of tip the whole thing over. And here's another wolverine visiting our traps or our hair snags rather and just moving them all around. You can, he hung out here for a little bit. Um, and then this image, you can kind of see he locks in on the camera. And then this was the next image that we got. Um, so we returned to that station. There was Fisher, at, or um, there was sign of Wolverine activity everywhere. And uh, we obviously didn't pick up any other uh, detections of animals because our camera was uh, halfway down the tree and completely, completely wonky. Um, and then this is just an illustration of a bit of the less glamorous side of field work. That's me kind of just tripping over a fallen log there. Um, and hopefully this video will work. We'll see if it does. This is just an example of uh, what we, uh, some of the conditions we went through to get to some of the, uh, some of our stations. So this is me just trying to trying to snowshoe my way through one of the stations. Unaware that I was being filmed. And then this one, I'm not sure if this will show up very well, but you can kind of see this is actually um, almost in that area from the last video. Um, but I started up in this corner here um, you can see kind of a little slide going down all the way down here. And that's where I ended up. <laughs> um, so just just illustrating, um, had, had a great time conducting the field work and working in Alaska and learned, learned an awful lot about fishers and the landscape there. Um, and so on that note, um, I'd like to thank the Alaska Wildlife Alliance for inviting me to give this talk tonight. Um, and then of course, everybody at University of Idaho, my, under, uh, my graduate advisor, Dr. Sophie Gilbert, Dr. Lachette Waits, um, Anthony Krupe at Alaska Department of Fish and Game has been so helpful. Um, and everyone at Alaska Department of Fish and Game in the Juneau uh, Douglas office has been so helpful and continues to be very helpful. Um, as well as everybody who took the time to come out to help me check the stations during my field season there. I had about 13 people come out at one time or another to help set and check the stations. Um, and I put in over 600 miles on snowshoe and foot that winter. So I really appreciated it whenever other people were willing to, uh, to help me out to check all of those stations. Um, and I'm, I'm very grateful for that and for everyone who helped make this uh, project possible. Um, and so if I have time, I will take questions. Caitlin, this is great. Thank you so much. I um, There's lots of virtual applause happening. And for those of you at home, it, it's hard to know what the audience reaction is. So if you have any comments for Caitlin, uh, please put them in the chat. Any We have some clapping emojis um, going on. And uh, from an organizational perspective, we are so grateful to all the biologists at Alaska Department of Fish and Game, the researchers at various universities who keep track of all these wildlife species and it's a complicated and <laughs> at times it seems harrowing job going across those slides. So um, it's, it's really important work. And uh, we do have some questions rolling in. If you have anything, feel free to put it in the chat, but I'll go ahead and start um, with 
my first question, and then I'll, I'll move into the group. Can you define a mustelid? <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's a guild that in general, they have a very similar body structure. So they all kind of have tubular body shapes there. Um, so yeah, like Wolverine or all like Wolverine, Martin, Ermine, they're all considered to be part of that um, mustelid guild. Um, and so, yeah, they generally will have similar requirements and life histories. Okay, great. Um, okay, we have a, a question. What is the threshold vegetation height that would limit where a fissure may occur? Yes, um, so I am not entirely sure on that. We were just looking at general trends. Um, so I'm not sure if there is a limit. Great. Okay, and but did you did you notice any spots where, um, like, was there anything in, in your data where you found that there were areas more likely to have fissure? No, um, and I was actually surprised that we found, especially in our study area, that vegetation height was important, um, particularly because, um, at least in the Juno area, a lot of the landscape was very similar, kind of homogenous. Um, so it's interesting that small changes in vegetation height did seem to have an effect. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, Linda asks, if fisher eat porcupine, which I didn't know, you said they specialized in it, so I'd like to know more about that. Um, they might be more in competition with larger predators like wolves and wolverines, and they um, would they have an impact on porcupine populations? Yeah, I think that's something that would have to be monitored. Like I said, they're still potentially expanding and potentially increasing their abundance. Um, and so even with these small um, spatial and temporal trends, they're still only slightly noticeable. Um, and so I'm not sure if they would potentially in the future, that might be something to look into um, if they do increase in abundance. Yeah. Um, okay, more questions rolling in. Um, are there, in the areas outside of Alaska where fissure occur, have other studies indicated similar temporal impacts between ermine, fisher, and marten where they overlap? Hmm. I, I, different studies have actually had some, um, did, have actually had very different results. Some have found that they didn't, um, that they weren't separated in space and time at all. And some have found that there are differences. So I think it might be very dependent on the landscape in question and potentially also just the abundance of the um, animals. But yeah, particularly the landscape, just because they do have, even though they have relatively similar habitat requirements, they are, um, if different habitats are available, like if there's more mixed conifer forest or like, um, different elevations, then there is the potential that they might have uh, less of an overlap in different areas, which could lead to um, less competition. So the spatial and temporal trends might be different. Mm. Great. Um, and uh, loved the photo of the ermine stealing bait, but um, yes, what, the problem. What, <laughs> yeah, what was the bait that you used? Uh, we used beaver. Okay. Um, okay, Karen asks, um, how widespread is Fisher Range in Southeast? Are they in locations other than the Juneau area? And I know you had a map, it might be, I don't know if it's difficult to get back to that. I'll zip on by. <laughs> Sorry for the whiplash. No, oh, good. <laughs> um, one of the first slides here. <laughs> Let's see. Um, yeah, so these are just the general regions that they've been documented so far. Um, so right here, if you're familiar with the Juno area, right here is the Taku uh, River region and then Juno right here. And then right this area was where we conducted our study. Great. Um, Okay, there, uh, there are probably too many questions to ask in this, so I'm gonna do some <laughs> filtering. Um, do fisher occur on other continents? You know, that is actually a good question. I know Martin do. Um, 
I would have to look into that. I'm actually not sure if they're endemic to just North America or not. Okay. And um, similarly, do Fisher, Martin, and or Ermine swim? I think there is definitely potential to. I think if they were to expand, they'd be more likely to just go on frozen river channels and such. Um, but I think there is the potential that they could do that. Okay. I'm not sure how far, but. <laughs> Have to get more camera traps out there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, Sue says, excellent presentation, Caitlin. Um, do you know how many fish are, are taken seasonally by trappers in Southeast? Um, and can trappers selectively target Martin, but not Fisher? If not much is known about abundance, as you stated, how can ADF and G allow trapping? Mm -hmm. um, can, so I guess I'll take this in parts. Can you repeat yeah, the part of it? <laughs> yes, yes. Um, uh, do you know how many fish are, are taken seasonally by trappers in Southeast? Um, it does vary throughout the years. Um, I think it's been pretty consistent for the last uh, couple of years. Um, anywhere from just, uh, just about two to three. Okay. And um, do you know if there's a way trappers can selectively target Martin and not Fisher? I'm not sure if they have necessarily tried. I'm sure that they can. Like I said, Fisher are a bit, a, quite a bit bigger. Um, so I'm sure they can modify traps and do things that way um, and potentially look at maybe if different baits or attractants might want, if one might um, be more attracted, one, if one species might be more attracted to one kind of thing than another. I'm sure they could do some targeted um, work like that. Yeah. And the, the third part of that question, which I, I don't know that you would know is, you know, how I think really how ADF and G could allow, could um, understand harvest population, you know, the number of fish are harvested when they're so new to the area. Do you have anything to speak to that? And I know you're, that might not be directly tied to your research. Yeah, I think it will just have to look at trends um, as the years kind of progress to really get an idea of uh, abundance. Okay. And we've had some some great Googling from participants who have confirmed okay. that they are endemic to North America. <laughs> so, All right, great. <laughs> thank you, group. <laughs> um, and uh, okay, if there are any more questions, there are a couple of comments and also I'll share the chat with Caitlin. Um, so if you have any comments on the presentation, feel free to send those kudos her way now. Um, uh, and my I had one more question, Caitlin, which was, if I remembered correctly, you said there were 84,000 photos. Yes. <laughs> um, how in the world, is there any sort of AI, I mean, computer programming that can help with that? That's a lot of time. Luckily, I, I don't know how, but I decided to actually keep on top of it. So every time we pulled cameras, I would just go through the cards right there. Um, and so some of those images, it, every time it took a photo, it was scheduled to take kind of a rapid fire burst. So it would take about three images. And then if the animal hung around, it would go through more than that. So sometimes you could just kind of go through and if it was the same kind of detection period, um, then it would be kind of quick. Um, and we also, in order to get some of those um, environmental measurements that I was talking about, like uh, snow depth, I actually had the cameras set to take a photo every day at noon. Um, so that accounts for a few of the photos too. But um, honestly, I think a lot of them were the squirrel photos. We had just under a thousand squirrel detections, um, but oftentimes they would just be running back and forth in front of the camera for quite a while. So I think a lot of it was probably that. It's incredible, yeah. <laughs> um, and also in the chat, there's a, some more conversation about the trapping questions. So if you're, um, if you know more about that, feel free to put that in the chat. Um, Karen also asked, uh, do you think that fisher will spread farther north or will they be limited by large mountain and glaciers, large mountains and glaciers near Glacier Bay or Mount Logan um, or by interior cold and non-coastal regions? Yeah, um, I think it'll just remain to be seen, especially just to see how the climate might change in the coming years. Um, and then I guess to see how hardy fisher are in the region, um, it's possible that I wouldn't put it past them to, you know, slip into any area with some potential habitat. So it will remain to be seen, I think. Great. Um, and okay, I'm not seeing any more questions, um, but one more that I had was that um, 
did I hear correctly that you say fishers specialize in eating porcupine? Yeah. How, how does that happen? I think, so, so some people have documented it actually, and I, I think it's pretty incredible. They're just able to um, kind of just flip, I think the key is kind of flipping the porcupine over um, and they can kind of, uh, they can get at the more um, maybe uh, soft parts of the porcupine. Um, they're able to specialize in that. But I do think people um, have actually observed Fisher doing that, which is how they, they know that, they, um, that they're really good at specializing on it. Eugene says, attacking the face. <laughs> um, great. Well, this is, uh, I think that's all the questions that I have. Um, but the, the comments are rolling in. Great presentation. Very interesting and nice to see your research. Uh, like I said, lots of clapping emojis. So um, let's just take a couple of minutes and um, send any comments you have to Caitlin. Um, and uh, I'm going to throw into the chat um, uh, a link to where if you're interested in supporting Wildlife Wednesdays, um, you can make a donation, become a member. Uh, we really appreciate the support. It helps keep all the coordination going and, um, you know, paying for the Zoom platform and flyers and things like that. So I'll throw that into the chat. Um, and again, really appreciate it. Um, and then a couple, a couple more comments rolling in in the chat about trapping. Um, and uh, Sue asks, what is the time frame for the Fisher Harvest map? Um, this current map, this is Fisher Harvest starting in 1996 to present. Okay. Great. Great. Um, okay, well, I'll just, I'll leave it on here a little bit. Um, Sue says, thanks. And I'm actually going to go ahead and stop recording. Um, should I stop sharing my screen? Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs>